Tech Reimagined. Redefining the relationship between people and technology. Brought to you by Andava. This is Tech Reimagined. Hello and welcome back to Tech Reimagined. I'm Bradley Howes and I'm glad to welcome you to the latest episode of our show. We're now full steam into season three, in which we explore how technology is influencing the fabric of our society, how we live, the way we work and how we do business. Every Thursday, we're lucky enough to have an interesting personality from the tech or business world as our guest. And speaking of interesting personalities, we're really excited to introduce you today to David Wade, the space underwriter for the Atrium Space Insurance Consortium, or ASIC. Hi, David. How are you today? Yeah, very well. Thanks, Bradley. Thank you. Well, before we jump straight into it, can you introduce yourself to our audience and let us know a bit more about your background? Yeah, sure. So... As you said, my name's David Wade. I'm the space underwriter with the Atrium Space Insurance Consortium. So the Atrium Space Insurance Consortium, or ASIC, is a consortium of nine Lloyd syndicates, uh, Lloyd syndicates who've delegated their underwriting um, for space risks um, to Atrium for, for us to underwrite on their behalf. So we have a $45 million line that we can write on any satellite, uh, any launch or, or any in-orbit satellite. Well, we're looking forward to hearing more about this. So the subject of today's episode is the space insurance market and the changes in innovation that it's seen over the decades. So just a bit of positioning here. According to Nature.com, 2022 was a record year for space launches, with SpaceX leading the way by some way as a private company. So in light of this, can you share with us what are the key areas of growth and opportunity in this space economy and how insurance companies are positioning themselves to capitalise on these trends? Yeah, absolutely. So the biggest growth areas are still with regard to satellite communications. You know, satellite communications has always been the most prominent use of satellites. Um, something like 50% of all of the satellites that are in orbit are used for communication purposes. And last year was no different. Um, you know, last year, the majority of satellite launches were for, for satellite communications. What has changed over the last few years is the way that we're providing those communications. Um, traditionally, satellites were used for broadcast uh, communications more than anything, so satellite TV. But what we've seen recently is that satellite broadcast is, is declining. You know, people want on-demand services now rather than uh, sitting down to watch linear TV at the time that it's broadcast. And what we're moving towards is, is those on-demand services. So the satellites are, are keeping pace, moving from broadcast towards broadband or data services. So what we've seen over the last few years is a lot more of those broadband or data type satellites being launched. Still communication satellites, but uh, providing data services rather than broadcast services. And in particular, uh, constellations. So constellations of satellites a large numbers of satellites operating from an orbit, low Earth orbit, maybe only five to a thousand kilometers up. The problem with satellites operating from that orbit is that they move with respect to the user on the ground. So if you're wanting a continuous service, you have to have multiple satellites to, to provide that continuous service uh, as those satellites move around the Earth. In the case of SpaceX and the Starlink service, they've now launched over 3,000 satellites to provide that uh, that continuous service um, using Starlink. And that's that's accounted for by far the majority of the launches in the last year. And each SpaceX launch is launching a few of the Starlink uh, satellites, yeah? That's right. So when they launch the Starlink satellites, they typically launch between about 40 and 60 satellites um, per launch. Uh, and then those satellites separate from the rocket and they take a few months to be then put into the correct position in orbit. Um, but now we're up to, I don't know, 50, 60 launches of Starlink satellites, 60 satellites at a time, up to 60 satellites at a time. So a tremendous project, um, huge growth potential. Um, those satellites will be used, as I said, for data services. Uh, one of the drawbacks of using the traditional satellites that were in geostationary orbit, so geostationary orbit are satellites that are sitting 36,000 kilometers above the equator. One of the problems with using those, those satellites for data services is the time delay as the signal goes out to the satellite and back again. So by bringing those satellites much closer to Earth allows those satellites to be integrated into the 5G networks and things like smart cities, driverless cars, and those kinds of services going forward. So that's where all of the interest and all of the growth areas are right now. 
And how does that affect the insurance industry then? Or how does the insurance industry work with space companies? Yeah, so, I mean, we're, we're typically insuring the launch of satellites and the in-orbit phase of those satellites' lives. Now, traditionally, we've insured satellites for the whole um, duration of their life. We've insured them you know, for the launch phase and then one year at a time for the entire, usually a 15-year lifetime for a, for a geostationary satellite. And that's been that's been the space insurance market's bread and butter for for the last thirty years. You know, we've insured those broadcast satellites, those geostationary satellites, for their entire lifetime. And what we're seeing with the constellations is that the operators are less interested in insurance. You know, they're launching hundreds to thousands of satellites, um, and each satellite it's built on a production line. It's quite cheap to manufacture. Um, so a lot of the constellation operators like Starlink, they're thinking about launching spare satellites rather than relying on insurance as a risk transfer mechanism. So what we've seen with the constellations is some are not buying insurance at all, and some are only buying insurance for the accumulation when the, those satellites are being launched. So if you're launching 50 on a single rocket, you, know, you buy some insurance for that launch phase only, but once the satellite separates from the from the rocket, then uh, then the insurance ceases, uh, and at that point you rely on having those spare satellites in orbit to continue in the service if any go wrong. So it hasn't necessarily been a great move for the space insurance market as uh, as the industry is developing, but that's that's something that we're having to deal with. We're looking at sort of different types of cover. Um, you know, to to try and take that forward, to try and show that insurance still has a role to play, even with this latest generation of communication satellites. For the constellation satellites, heaven forbid they were to ever fall back down to Earth, but they're within the atmosphere, aren't they? So would they break up? Yeah, they're, they're above the atmosphere. They're typically at 500 to 1,000 kilometers. But even at that height, you still get very tenuous reaches of the atmosphere. So you still get a drag force acting on the satellite. So over a period of time, when those satellites stop working, they will gradually come back down, re-enter the atmosphere and burn up. At a height of maybe 600 kilometers, that might take 20 years or more to happen. Um, so that satellite will continue to float around up there for, for 20 years or so, posing a threat until it re-enters the atmosphere. Out of all the launches and the vessels or aircraft that we put into space, uh, what kind of percentage are covered by insurance? Very few. Um, so at the moment, there's over 6,000 active satellites in orbit, but only 300 are insured. Um, so very few satellites, 5% uh, that are currently insured. The majority of those are the communication satellites, um, sorry, the, the large geostationary communication satellites, the ones providing data services and broadcast from geostationary orbit. Those satellites might be valued at up to, well, $400 million or more. Um, so insurance for those single assets is, is almost essential. The ones in in low Earth orbit, the one, the constellation satellites providing um, communications um, from low Earth orbit, yeah, they're generally not insured. The other satellites that are insured are um, imaging satellites. So we see a lot of the the satellites taking images. You know, you would have seen on the news, for example, those images coming out of Ukraine, seeing the uh, the troop uh, build up, the Russian troop build up on the border of Ukraine. You will have seen that a lot of those those images had uh, Maxar as a tagline on the on the on the image. Uh, Maxar is a is a company that operates those imaging satellites. Uh, they're called the Worldview satellite. Can take images of down to about a quarter of a meter resolution um, from six hundred kilometer orbits. Um, so they operate in from low Earth orbit. And we also we've also been insuring recently. We've we've been insuring some of the capsules that take the cargo and crew to the space station. Um, so, you know, we get in some, involved in some of those activities around the space station, um, carrying carrying cargo, resupply missions um, up to the space station. So, when SpaceX does a launch, I'm just trying to think about how the the sales process would work. So, when SpaceX does a launch or starts speaking to another space company about carrying cargo, do they say, "Would you like insurance with that?" And if they do want insurance, then they contact you. 
Usually it comes via the satellite operator that will be putting the satellite on top of the launch vehicle. I mean, we're what we're insuring really is the satellite um, rather than the launch vehicle itself. Um, so usually the satellite operator will contact a space insurance broker uh, and then the broker will come to, to uh, the space insurance underwriters uh, to underwrite those risks. It's a very small market, 30, 35 underwriters worldwide that cover uh, space insurance and five brokers. So it's a very small market. It's uh, you know it tends to be the known the known players. Um, so yeah, a, a satellite operator. There's probably only I mean there's a, a lot more startups now, but there's probably still only a hundred satellite operators in the world. Um, certainly, who are at that point of buying insurance, who've la- who are launching satellites and buying insurance. So it's an incredibly small market. But yeah, what we're covering is the satellite. So it's the satellite operator that triggers that process and, and, and starts the purchase of the insurance. How do you use data in order to work out your pricing? I mean, is there enough of a data pool? I know there's lots of satellites, but there haven't been that many launches to build up trends. Yeah, I mean, since you know, there's only been maybe 12,000 satellites launched since uh, since Sputnik 1 back in 1957. And yeah, the number of satellites is growing rapidly at the moment. So yeah, the the number of satellites in orbit uh, has doubled in the last twenty four months. So it's you know we're seeing really recent developments at the moment. Um, you're right. I mean, it, it, using data can be quite difficult. Um, certainly, you know, with only three hundred insured satellites from maybe ten different manufacturers across numerous different countries, not all of which are insured. Uh, consistently so you know we have our favorite countries and uh, and manufacturers to insure as do other people so getting hold of data can be quite tricky and i think that's one of the reasons why in the space insurance market most of the uh, satellite underwriters most of the space underwriters have an engineering background themselves um, so you know a lot of the space underwriters studied aerospace engineering or worked in the space industry because before coming into insurance um, and if you didn't do that, you probably employ an engineer who did um, as a consultant or, or as part of your team. Um, so really, we're not using statistics very much um, on, the, on the space insurance side. We're really having to, to you know, go down to grassroots level and look at the risk from the ground up. You know, we're still reliant very much on technical briefings, going to visit the satellite manufacturing facilities, going to visit the launch sites uh, and the rocket manufacturing facilities and really seeing that technology. And more than anything, it's it's understanding what's changing from the last satellite. So take somebody like Airbus, they have a product line called the Eurostar 3000. That's currently transforming into the next generation called the Eurostar Neo. And really what we're looking at there is how that technology is changing. You know, a lot of the technology is the same as what's flown before. Parts obsolescence is an issue. So we're looking at sort of, well, what what new parts are being introduced, what testing is being done you know, as they're improving the performance of that component, what testing is being done to show that it will co- continue to operate as expected. You know, what testing are they doing to make sure it survives the space environment? So we're looking at that kind of data rather than sort of data analytics or any big data set. What's always interesting for us, and one of our worst case scenarios, is if we were to have a generic defect. Um, A lot of components on satellites are only available for one or two, from one or two manufacturers worldwide. Um, So you end up with US manufacturers, European manufacturers, Japanese manufacturers, all using the same components from the same suppliers. And if we had a generic defect in one of those components that wasn't captured for a few years, you know, let's say it was some sort of deterioration, uh, which only got spotted a few years after after the satellites had been launched. We might have a significant number of satellites in orbit um, that could be exposed to that defect, um, and that that's one of our worst case scenarios. Um, within Lloyd's, we we have a realistic disaster scenario to look at that particular instance um, to try and capture what our worst case losses could be. I've got so many questions from that answer. So, so what, did you, what did you study before you became an underwriter? 
My first degree was in aerospace engineering, and then I did a master's degree in astronautics and space engineering at Cranfield University. I was always interested in the space side, um, but undergrad, there was very little at the time that was available that uh, was solely focused on space. So I had to do aerospace engineering and do as many modules as I could related to space. But then to specialize in space, I needed that master's degree. And then uh, you talked about um, uh, needing to do some investigation because there just isn't a lot of data. So for launches, do you get involved with SpaceX or any other launch provider um, to understand what safeguards they have around their technology that you are ensuring a, a satellite that's part of their payload? Yes, that's right. Yeah. So any new launch service provider that comes along, take SpaceX as an example, they know that you know they have to convince the insurance market. You know, insurance is an enabling um, has an enabling function. You know, without the insurance, those companies are not going to get the investment that they need to build the satellite. Um, so SpaceX need, knows that they need to convince the insurers that their launch vehicle is safe. Um, so prior to the Falcon Nine, the SpaceX rocket, prior to that launching. We were invited to the SpaceX factory. We were having briefings from SpaceX on a regular basis to keep us informed about the development of the launch vehicle. Um, you know, factory visits to allow us to see the the testing facilities that were being put in place, um, the manufacturing process that they were going through, you know, the quality procedures that they were operating under. You know, they went to a lot of effort to prove to us that they they had the right people, the, the right knowledge. They were building a reliable and, and good rocket. And yeah, that, that process probably started, I would guess, three, four years ahead of the first launch of the Falcon 9. Um, and typically, typically you have a couple of launches uh, which are not insured uh, right at the start, just to prove that all the technology works, that it's all come together. Um, so, so typically, we see a couple of test flights prior, be, you know, before the insurance uh, uh, community has to start insuring the first flight. So, yeah, we're working with all the satellite manufacturers, all of the all of the launch service providers, um, some time in advance of the first launch, just to uh, to know the technology. Um, so, that by the time we see it, we're comfortable with it. Do you see SpaceX? Because it, as a standard member of the public, it seems such a revolutionary type of company from how it goes about its marketing to the average person etc do you think there'll be other companies that start following in its footsteps and having reusable rockets with um you know such a great consumer marketing yeah yeah absolutely absolutely they've they've shown the way they've shown how different things can be i mean the space industry was kind of stuck in its ways you know rockets have to be thrown away they're not reusable um and spacex has shown that it can be done differently uh, and shown that it can be done differently and cost effectively um I mean, 10 years ago, you know, the idea of reusing a rocket was crazy. <laughs> we, you know, we were worried about reusing a rocket. Let alone getting the first the first one to land on a floating platform in the middle of the sea. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, they've shown what's possible. I mean, we've now insured, I mean, just about every launch that we that we insure now on for, for SpaceX uh, is a reused rocket. I actually get more nervous now when it's a rocket flying for the first time from SpaceX rather than one that's been reused. We've insured one launch that was using the first stage of the rocket for the 14th time. Um, and I think since then, SpaceX has actually launched a rocket for the first stage of a rocket for the 15th time. And that was absolutely unheard of. Um, all of the other launch service providers are trying to catch up. Mitsubishi in, or MHI in Japan uh, building the H3. That should have launched last week, but they've had a delay uh, at the last second. The, the rocket engine actually ignited and then uh, something happened, so they had to close down the, uh, had to terminate the ignition. So that's delayed further. The European rocket Ariane, they're developing the Ariane 6, but again, delays, uh, numerous delays. You know, that should have been flying by now. It's probably going to fly very late this year the, for the first time. Um, so we will see a gap between the the last Ariane 5 and the and the first launch of the Ariane 6. ULA, another US operator, uh, launch service provider, they're transitioning from the Atlas V to the Vulcan launch vehicle, but again, face delays. 
and Jeff Bezos with um, with Blue Origin, his launch vehicle, New Glenn, is is also facing delays at the moment. So there's nobody, you know, there's nobody in the same camp as SpaceX at the moment. You know, they've launched the Falcon Nine about two hundred times now, and every all of the other launch service providers are still trying to catch up with the Falcon Nine. You know, SpaceX is getting ready to launch Starship, their next generation launch vehicle. You know, whilst the rest of the market is still trying to capture it, catch up to what SpaceX has been doing for the last ten years. Um, so what they've achieved is absolutely incredible, and they've set the they've certainly set the goal posts. There there are other companies looking at reusability. Um, so there's a company called Rocket Lab um, operates a small launch vehicle called Electron. Um, and that is already trying to test out some reusability ideas. They've brought a couple of stages back down, have not managed to successfully recover a stage yet, but you know, they're on the way. They're trying to do it. Um, they're going to capture that stage as it falls under a parachute. They're going to capture that stage by a helicopter and return it to the landing site using, uh, you know, using a, a mid-air capture by a helicopter to, uh, to to capture the first stage rather than landing it on a barge. Um, it's quite a small launch vehicle, so it's uh, significantly smaller than something like the Falcon Nine. Um, yeah, New Glenn, the the Blue Origin uh, launch vehicle that intends to reuse the first stage. Um, so yeah, that is definitely the way going forward. Um, but it's just taken a, a long time for the others to catch up with what SpaceX has already achieved. So when you visit the factories and and check what they're doing, I, I just can't visualize how you're checking the manufacturing processes. Is it simply a case? And I don't mean that, mean that in any bad term. Is it simply a case of checking the building according to specification that you've previously signed off on? Or are you looking for new materials or any other techniques that, that's going on? Yeah, I mean, we're what we we're not the experts by any means. Um, you know, we have the knowledge, we have some experience, but we're not the experts. So really, I mean, visiting a factory is just a is the icing on the cake to see what they say they're doing being put into practice. We could probably get everything that we need from a from a technical briefing. But what we're looking for is um, you know, to quiz them on, have they thought about this aspect? Have they considered, oh, I don't know, um, you know what, what are their margins? Uh, what quality control procedures are they, are they using? Um, you know, um, if they're using this new piece of technology, what testing have they done to show that it's going to, going to work correctly? Uh, are we satisfied with that, that uh, testing that's been done? Um, are they using standard design methodologies? Are they using standard margins that we would expect to see? Those kinds of things um, are what we're quizzing. You know, so if you've got uh, an electric motor, for example, you would expect it to be have the torque um, at least twice what you need. If a satellite manufacturer said, well, we're using a lower level than that, we would want to know why and what testing have they done to prove that that was acceptable and those kinds of things. Um, yeah, the satellite manufacturers and the satellite operators, the launch service providers, they're the experts. Um, so we are heavily reliant on them. Um, but we just want to see how it's all being put into practice and, and have our chance at quizzing them to make sure that we're comfortable with the risk. Are there any international laws or regulations which apply to space vehicles as well? Yeah, so all space activities are governed by UN treaties. Um, but those UN treaties were written in the 1960s and 70s. Um, you know, when it was Russia, or the USSR in those days, and, and America uh, launching um, you know, launching objects that were state owned, you know, and usually or a lot of them for military purposes. You know, so those UN treaties don't really lend themselves very well to you know, to the current commercial market. You know, we have to work within those those treaties. But it is it is the launching state. What's what's defined in the UN treaties is the launching state. So that is the state that procures or launches the satellite. It is that launching state that ultimately holds responsibility, and those those responsibilities are then passed on to the commercial satellite operator through a commercial license. So you would have, in the case of the UK, you would have somebody like the UK Space Agency or the Civil Aviation Authority would issue that license to say that you are allowed to launch that satellite. And one of the requirements that the UK government passes on is the need for some third party liability insurance. So it's, it comes down from the UN treaties via these local 
um, local licenses um, that are issued by the individual nations regulators and some of those then might start to impose particular requirements on the commercial operators. So when you talk about third party liability that's one vessel hitting someone else's vessel? Yeah, yeah. How often does that happen? <laughs> well, not very not very often thankfully. Uh it has happened um 2009 we did have a collision between two satellites uh in orbit. Um and that was uh, you know that created a shower of of debris. Um I think it was about 600 pieces of debris that were generated when those two satellites collided. Um, it doesn't happen often, thankfully. And under the UN treaties, you know, this is protecting objects in orbit as well as objects on or other property on the ground. So if a launch vehicle were to fail and that rocket or, or parts of the satellite or rocket were to fall to the ground and damage property on the ground, then you are liable. You know, the country, the launching state that allowed that launch to take place is liable uh, for any damage that is caused. In all, but you have to prove fault. Uh, and that's much more difficult. You know, if you've got two satellites in their respective orbits intersecting and they collide, how do you prove fault? And we've never seen a successful case brought for a collision in orbit. Thankfully, there's been very few. But, um, you know, that's, you know, that's one of the difficulties with, with the UN Treaty is actually proving fault um, for a collision in orbit. It will, 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 well, it'll certainly keep the lawyers happy. But, um, but it, it's a very difficult uh, thing to do. Wow. Wow. Um, one final question. Uh, we've been talking about private companies and governments as well. Do you insure both? Yes, yes. Although governments very rarely, um, occasionally we'll get um, we'll get to see a project. A, a lot of a lot of com- countries operate their satellites as if as if they're through a commercial sector. So we do get to see some um, imaging satellites. We get to see some meteorological satellites, you know, which are part of the the government's Met Office, let's say, or uh, armed forces but they're operated as a commercial satellite. So we do get to see some of those activities. In other cases, just the way that the contract is written allows us to get involved, say the missions to the space station. We are covering some of the cargo capsules or some of the capsules that carry cargo to the space station. And the way that those contracts have been written, this is uh, with with NASA. NASA is now... um, asking or, or procuring those launch services on a commercial basis. So rather than buying and operating and, and uh, launching their own launch vehicle, they are going to the commercial sector and saying, you build this capsule, you launch this rocket. We will pay when you achieve certain milestones. And that means that that company can then come to the insurance market and purchase insurance for those unearned milestones, You know, one of which is sort of, safe delivery of the of the cargo to the space station after launch so they can come to the insurance market and insure insure those aspects so we're not insuring the government directly but it's a government contract to a commercial operator that we then that we then insuring i said that was the last question but i've got another one based on what you, your answer is the space station the international space station in short no, it's not. It's not. Um, parts of it, or, or certain modules, or certain certain flights to the space station are insured, but the space station itself is not. Um, I don't think there's enough capacity to insure the space station. It's a hundred billion dollar project, um, <laughs> and um, multiple international partners. But uh, there are there are waivers between the different countries um, so that they don't hold each other liable. When we go forward to the moon, I mean, we're now sort of getting towards the end of the lifespan of the space station. Um, And NASA said that they intend to leave low Earth orbit to the commercial sector. Uh, NASA's now interested in going back to the moon. And there'll be a a small space station that orbits around the moon from which the astronauts will then go from Earth to that small space station and go down to the lunar surface and back up to the space station when they need to. Um, the intention is that some of those components will be um, will be insured. Um, so the power and propulsion element, the um, habitation uh, module, those contracts will be done on the same basis as the contracts for 
the um, for the cargo missions that we currently do to the space station. So there will be an element of uh, of insurance required for those lunar missions going forward. David, that's been so interesting. It's just such a fascinating industry. To all of our listeners, if you found this episode insightful, please spread the love and share it with your network or just follow us on any of the major podcast platforms. We're always interested in your feedback, so please either go to endava.com and click on the contact button or you can contact us at Endava on any of the major social platforms. Until next Thursday, I'm Bradley Howes and this 